Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to read to us from Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24. You know the text very well. This is just by way of introduction. And you've probably done this before. You've probably heard sermons on this before. But as we look at these verses, try to extract out three essentials to spiritual growth. Okay, can see if you can identify those. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, were you able to identify those three essentials to spiritual growth? What would be the first one? Okay, put off. Okay, so put off the old man. What's the third one? I'm going to make it a little bit difficult on you. What's the third one? Okay, yeah, put on. Very good. And you put on the new man, put off the old man. Now, that's often what we think of when we think about spiritual growth, don't we? We think about the essential of repenting, turning from, rejecting categorically the old man, and then we think of what? Putting on the new man. There's nothing really wrong with that, per se. I mean, that would be right in principle, but scripturally, there's something that's right sandwiched between that that really is, you could say, an essential that should not be diminished in any way and should be well remembered. What is that middle essential? Be renewed. Okay, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Okay, so those three kind of all work together. I don't know if you just could think of them as step one, step two, then step three. They're all working together. Even in the renewal of the mind, something's brought to light, and that really causes us to reject something of the old man and embrace the new man. It's, it's all somewhat together. It's not necessarily a clean one, two, three. But this is essential and really what we find when we go into the New Testament, Old Testament would be the same as well, is that there is an inseparable link between our thoughts and our conduct or our heart. You could put it this way. There's an inseparable link between our theology, our doctrine, what we think, and who we are and what we do. You could go to many different texts to try to see this. Uh, but what I would like to do is I would like to look at our text tonight and see if we can identify those together. Now, sometimes what you might have is, and we could take time to look at different texts, and I thought about doing that, but really just for the sake of time, sometimes you have the theology presented first with the application. Sometimes you have an exhortation to a certain conduct, then you have the theology or the way to think, that, that which supports it coming afterwards. Now let's turn over to James chapter 4 and see if we can identify this. James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. See if you can identify, in this case, it's going to be the application first, and then the thinking, the doctrine, the theology to support that. The reasons in our minds which will affect our heart as to why we should do this. James chapter 4, and we'll start reading in verse 11. So we're looking for those two things, those two elements. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges, judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Were you able to identify it? What's the exhortation? Did you find that? The application to our conduct. Did you see it there? What is that? In verse 11, speak not evil, right? Speak not evil one of another. Now, what is the supporting thought, doctrine, theology that's being given to support that exhortation? Did you find that? What are the, in other words, what are the reasons why we should not speak evil one of another? How would you frame that in your own words? 
Okay, it's, you don't want to pass judgment because to speak evil of another person is to pass judgment upon them. Okay, and we've said before that many have compared this book to the Sermon on the Mount, and we can identify in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7 that exhortation not to judge. And here we have that same principle, so that would be very accurate. Anything else that we could find here? Okay, that we're not the judge, so we'd be usurping a position uniquely reserved to God alone. Good, good. And the other one might be a little bit more hidden, and we're going to get to that. But that would be what we find in the text. You might be able to pull, maybe some people pull four out of that. Most people pull three out of the text, and we're going to be looking at that tonight. So we want to look at this idea of evil speaking, evil speaking. And again, it's very clear in this text, this is, this is really addressing believers in the church. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for your grace. Just pray that you'd bless and that you would empower in, uh, in the teaching and preaching through the text and as well the application to our own hearts. Thank you for what you'll do in that. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So if we were trying to talk about the sin itself, really we could say the sin is evil speaking, but the implication later on in the text is that evil speaking is also at the core what? It is, as Pastor Omrod said, it is judging. So let's understand a little bit about that. To speak evil and to judge, let's put that together. It means to damage the reputation of someone, to criticize unfairly, to charge with an accusation, to implicate with a crime, to speak of uh, with a disapproving or fault-finding spirit. Fault-finding is the idea that you're just nitpicking all that they're doing and you're looking at the motivations behind what they're doing and you're trying to, to identify the reason they did this is really because they are thinking this or this is the way they are. You can even speak of destructive verbal attacks and gossip and false accusations. Interestingly, this command is in the active, and it's, it's implying by that that this was something they were continually known for doing. Believers were known for this activity, and it wasn't just at the church in Jerusalem. Remember, he's writing this to whom? To believers scattered all throughout the Roman kingdom. This was known as a continual issue among brethren. I don't know what happened. And James is there. Did he... Did, Different people that were traveling around come in, and when he asked about the believers in different areas, oh, yes, so-and-so is doing well. Yes, this group of believers over here is doing well, but a lot of infighting. There's a lot of problems. Even when where we were serving last after COVID and the previous team members left for a period of time, there was no one there. This is what started happening. And now it's really just fractured, and no one's willing to come together. They're willing to come with the worker that's there, but not willing to come one another together as a group of believers. So I don't know exactly what happened, but obviously James found out about this, and it was very troubling. The idea here is slander, but the idea can be vast-reaching, lots of different definitions. I gave you from multiple different sources, and you can pull that all in together, but... One commentator stated this, I thought was well said, slander was denounced as the third tongue because it slew three persons, the speaker, the spoken to, and the spoken of. Did you catch what he's saying by that? When slander's used, when slander's used, it slays three people. The speaker himself, the one spoken to, and the one spoken of. It actually has a damaging effect to everyone involved. Though many times those involved in it don't really realize that, but it is the reality. Now we know the scripture says, as we already pointed out in Matthew 7, 1, that we should not judge. And we're not going to go into other texts. There's enough here for us to stay here. There's lots of material on this. And we've looked at Matthew 7 before. But in respect to what we're talking about with this matter of speaking evil against, and all that implies, and at the root, what takes place when that happens, of judging and condemning and finding accusation and guilt upon other people. There's two clarifications, clarifications that we need to make. The first is simply an answer to a question. Do these sins always violate truth? 
to speak evil of someone or to judge someone, do those sins always violate truth? What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, is it always necessary for somebody to say an untruth? For somebody to speak evil of another person, let me ask, if I look at this introspectively, for someone to speak evil of me and to judge me for something that I have done, will they, do they have to speak an untruth? And I look at myself and say, absolutely not. I think that's an important clarification. Many times it is. Many times it's skewed. Many times it's with assumptions upon and, 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 and really thinking into the mind of the person that's being spoken of, signing wrong motives to their words and things. Of Many times it's like that, but it's not necessary. But these sins always violate at least two things. They may not violate truthfulness, but they always will violate humility and love. They will always violate those two. I think that's a good point. Now, it's interesting, this text, coupled with the text previous in, in, in the book of James, James 2.8, they're all going back to an exact context in the book of Leviticus. I'm going to read you just the sections in that context. I don't want to read the whole broad context, but listen to this. It's out of Leviticus 19. It's verses 16 to 18. Now, verse 18 says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's quoted in James 2.8. But at the head of that context in Leviticus, in Leviticus 16, Leviticus 18 is where thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In Leviticus 16, it says this, thou shalt not go up and down as a tail bearer among thy people. And tail bearer is not just talking about somebody who just says an untruth. It's, it's talking about slander. In fact, the definition is an action or crime of making a false spoken statement damaging to a person's reputation. And I believe we could qualify that and say it's not always false. But it is something that does not respect the love for that person, and it is say, said with an elevated pride in the soul that lifts one up as a judge of another. Another question of clarification. What is this text not prohibiting? I'd like to give us at least three things it's not prohibiting because sometimes we can come to this text and if we have a strong conscience before God, I mean, we're just going to, oh, we should never, ever speak any word against another. What's the difficulty with that? We find, we find in Scripture itself examples of those that were spoken against and even named. We find exhortations to identify and to deal with issues in people. And so let me just give three clarifications. What is this, this text not prohibiting? It's not prohib prohibiting three Ds, discernment, discipline, and defense. Discernment, discipline, and defense. Discernment in this way of the wrong conduct in others, like 2 Thessalonians 3.14. Discipline such as what we find in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8. Discipline of a church member. And defense in carefully identifying those who might damage the flock or damage the church, Romans 16, 17. When you're dealing with the matter of necessity of discipline or discernment or defense, this is not in the same category. And even as we have in Scripture, there, there's a way of dealing with discipline. It isn't just that you go broadcast it to everyone. There's a proper method. We're not going to go into those details, but it's just to say this is not contradictory to all of that content. Psalm 50, verse 12 says this, Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thine own mother's son. This is a problem that goes far, far back. <laughs> Psalm 101, verses 4 and 5, A forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath a high look and a proud heart will I not suffer. You see how the pride goes with the slander? So with that, let's look at three factors for abstaining from evil speaking. Three factors for abstaining 
from evil speaking. And they're very simple, and I believe you'll see them in the text. The, one, the first one is a little bit hidden, but there is an emphasis in the text, and I think it is a point in the text. And that is the relational factor, the relational factor. In other words, we, need, we must abstain from evil speaking because it's a sin against the family. The context is in, within the family of believers here. Now, it would be inappropriate even outside of that, but it's talking about an issue within the body, and I think you see that within the text. It says, speak not evil one of another, what? Brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother. Three times used in the text. is definitely speaking of a relational issue. And we can find in other texts, not just in the book of James, that this was a problem in the early church, as it is here today in the Western world. It has been a problem perpetually. And it's a perpetual failure to really take the truths that support this exhortation to heart, to apply to our souls and just cut this kind of sin off. In Ephesians 4, 1, it says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Let these things be put away from you. They should have no part in a believer's life. 1 Peter 2, 1 to 3, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, put these things away from you. Now, where is the place that we as individuals find it so easy to just bear everything in our hearts? You ever notice this if you've had children that have grown up in your home that, you know, you might find them saying or doing something in the house that they would never do in front of other people because it would be embarrassing to them. You know what children tend to find sometimes? What children find is that their parents say and do things that they would never do openly, especially, especially at church. So whether it's the child or the parent, it's the same issue. Why is that? Because inside of the home and the protection of those four walls, we tend to just, just open up the valve, remove all restraints, and let our hearts shine in all of their darkness. Well, this is our home. These are the four walls. This is the family. One of my friends, uh, we were working for a Christian man, and uh, we're doing roofing. I don't know if you've ever done, have any of you done roofing before? Any roofers here? A little bit of roofing? I roofed in the summer between my junior and senior year down in South Carolina. Just so you know, it's, it's not cool in South Carolina in the summer, and the humidity level is not low. I remember times when we'd wear something to protect from the sweat, and I, I had other, another mass up there that's not evident right now, but I would have a lot of sweat, and you would just bend over, and just the sweat would just pour from your head. And uh, I remember my friend, we were, we were all believers that worked in the crew, but he had a particular struggle as he worked through the summertime, and it was that he had, a trouble, he had trouble with another believer that was there. And what, what was evident, and I've seen this since and have had conversation with others since then, is that when what happens around other believers is we tend to just open the valve and let everything hang out. And what happens on the other side is they close off the valve of God's grace and they get offended. If, if, if it was that you were working with a lost roofer and he was acting that way, grace Lots of grace. It's somebody that's lost. I want to see them come to Christ. Grace and grace. That's a believer. He should, do, he should know better. I close off the valve of grace. Him a believer with me a believer. Ah, let's just let it all hang out. We're all in the same family. And that can tend to happen within a church. Now, that might be foreign to you, but it happens. And it's exceptionally damaging. What's needed is the truths here need to bring in and constrain the soul, the heart of the speaker. And whenever that does happen, though the text doesn't imply this, it is that we need to let grace be shown to those who fail in this area. We all need grace from one another. 
Now, how important is this issue of not speaking evil to another? Well, let me, let me, let me take another angle on this. Okay, with, again, within the family, we're still in the relational aspect of it. Do you know all the different texts, not all of them, but do you know these different texts within the New Testament where it talks about our ministry one to another, our responsibilities one to another? In fact, you're going to have that phrase used one to another over and over again throughout the New Testament. Or one another, like exhort one another. You're going to have many, many. In fact, you're going to have so many. I'm going to show you a list here. This is a list, and up here it says at the top, one another, and here are 31 different exhortations, and some of them have multiple verses to deal with the same kind of exhortation, and these are all one another texts, 31 of them. These are all positive, relational exhortations that, in, in, that we should have in our relationship with one another in this body, in this body, among us, the people that are here. So, let's ask some questions. Can you list off any of those besides exhort one another? Can you think of any? Okay, love one another, good. Any others? You don't have to give me the Bible verse for it, yeah. To be kind to one another, okay. And I'm not even going to be able to tell you if it's in the list or not, because I don't know the whole list, but... What else do we have? The end of Ephesians 4, maybe? Okay, to bear one another's burdens. Yeah, out of Galatians 6. Good. Any others? Okay, to be patient, long-suffering with one another. Can I just read just a few of them to you? Love one another, be devoted to one another, honor one another above yourselves, live in harmony with one another, build up one another, be like-minded towards one another, accept one another, Admonish one another, greet one another, care for one another, be patient with one another, speak the truth in love, be kind and compassionate to one another, submit to one another, consider others better than yourselves, bear with one another, comfort one another, encourage one another, exhort one another. These all different ones here. Stir up one another to love and good works, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, and so on. 31 of them, okay? Now, let's ask a question. How many of these commands would be undermined if we spoke evil one to another. If we spoke evil of the brethren, how many of these relational exhortations for right relations with one another would be undermined, would be, their legs would be cut out, that we wouldn't be effective in it towards one another? How many of these? <laughs> I found directly, without a doubt in my mind, 19 absolutely would be directly Related, I think if the person understood that you spoke evil against them, absolutely all of them are gone. They're not going to accept your hospitality, right? They're not going to accept your teaching, right? They know that you also speak evil against them. So very interesting. And so I think what I would like to say by that is that exalts the importance of this little command. Because if this is happening, it breaks down everything that should be there positively between us. Everything. It's all broken down. All 31 of them are broken down, especially if it's known that that's taken place. So that's a relational factor. So no wonder it says in Colossians 3.14, above all these things put on charity or love, which is the bond of perfectness, or as another translation puts it, puts it, which is the perfect bond of unity. Love, that perfect bond of unity. Second factor, you have the relational factor, then you have the legal factor, the legal factor. In other words, in the text, according to 11b, it's a sin against God's word. It's a sin against the brethren, it's a sin against God's word. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. Now, just see if you can follow this. I try to be really careful, but it's a little bit hard to follow. I, I just admit that. If you don't catch it, that's fine. Anytime we presumptuously act against the law of God, in other words, we know law, God's law says this, 
and we presumptuously act against the law of God, we exalt ourselves above it. Second point, anytime we act presumptuously against the law of God, in other words, we justifiably, knowingly commit something against the law of God. And it's with with self-justification that what we are doing is the thing that must be done. That happens all the time with speaking evil against another person. Then we are actually not just exalting ourselves above God's law, we are declaring that God's law is incorrect. It's like somebody going 50 and a 35, police officer pulls him over, and he says, listen, there's not a single side street that goes here. This really is a 50-mile-per-hour road. That's why I go 50 on it. I always go 50 on it. It's a 50-mile-per-hour road. You see, He's not only exalting himself above God's law, he's saying, or above the law of the road, he's saying the law of the road is what? Wrong. It's incorrect. Then thirdly, anytime we exalt ourselves and speak wrongly against God's law, those two first points, we then become the what? The judge. We become the judge. Now consider a few ways this is, this is possible. God laws, God's law says not to do something, but we do it anyway. What's the conclusion? God's law is not authoritative. It has no authority. If God's law says not to do something, but we do it anyway, we say that God's law is not best. If, we, if God's law says not to do something, but we do it anyway, then our, our words are speaking that it is not right. So in, res, in just pulling that together, in speaking evil of another, which is contrary to God's law, we are saying that God's law is not authoritative, best, or righteous. That's what we are saying about God's law. Now, let's pull ourselves to the last point. The relational factor, the legal factor, and the Godward factor. The Godward factor. And this is maybe a point that's a little bit harder to see, but we did extract it out together as a group. What is it saying here? It says, but if thou judge the law, thou art a doer, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judges another? Who is the only judge? God is. In fact, it says in many verses, Psalm 75, verse 7, but God is judge, Isaiah 33, 22. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver, Genesis 18, 25. The judge of all the earth, referring to God. What is happening when somebody usurps his authority and sets himself up as judge? What kind of sin is that? What do you call that? What do you call it when someone takes the position of God? What do you think? Well, I want to give you not just one. I'm going to give you five testimonies regarding this context and this sin. Five of them. These are five different theologians that have written about this, not the same book possibly not even the same publisher, listen to what all of them are saying. To set oneself above the law is to usurp the divine prerogative. Second one, usurping his judging authority by judging a person is really a blasphemy of God. Third one, but there is another reason why slandering another is so wrong. It also involves the infringement of the unique right of God himself. Fourth, Thus, usurping his judging authority by judging a person is really a blasphemy of God. And fifth, to value our opinions above the law is to value ourselves above him. To take up the position of judge is to elbow him off his throne. So what is everyone saying when they look at this verse? What is the God word sin? It's one word. It's blasphemy. That's powerful. And all we started out with is a 
proudful, self-justified, evil word about another person. And what just happened was we sinned against them as a family member in the kingdom of God. We sinned against God's law. We committed a sin of blasphemy against God himself. That is powerful theology to thwart any evil speaking, to make us close our mouths. You can understand the importance of it as well when you consider the fact that this sin undermines everything of proper relationship to one another in the body of Christ. You can understand it. I don't know if you've ever known a church that has gone through troubles or if you've experienced them yourselves. And though it's not in the text, what is the right response when you are the victim of evil speaking? That's very difficult. I know I've seen it before. We were on the field, I think probably within the first year, I saw that against one of our coworkers, and I saw him respond in a humble way. Humility it did not rise up in anger, it did not rise up in throwing accusation back again, it did not lift itself up in jealousy and envy, but just responded like what I could imagine to some degree, maybe just a shadow of it, of how Christ responded on the cross in that humble submission, committing himself unto the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for your grace. Thank you for the time in your word tonight. Pray, Father, that you would help us, that you would 